I have called this lecture a personal journey because in the area of interfaith dialogue, I consider myself a practitioner rather than an academic scholar of the subject. Moreover, I want to include a little of my own personal experience of the last 40 years because the personal may help bridge the gap between the very different cultural and historical backgrounds of a European Jew and a Japanese audience. In fact, I am currently in the strange position of finding myself the subject of a chapter in a doctoral dissertation from the University of Cologne. It is devoted to a particular series of interfaith conferences, Jewish Christian and Jewish Christian Muslim, that I helped found and organize some 40 years ago. The dissertation explored the theological basis for engaging in interfaith dialogue as reflected in these particular conferences. Today in Western Europe, interfaith dialogue in various forms is an area of growing interest and investment at personal, academic, and governmental levels. European countries have become places of immigration in part as the legacy of empire, in part as desirable places for refugees from areas of ethnic or religious intolerance and conflict or of extreme poverty. Moreover, these European countries in the past viewed themselves as having a homogeneous population and as being Christian in their religious orientation, perhaps with a small minority of non-conformist groups such as the Jews. However, recent decades, have seen a growth in particular of sizable Muslim communities from North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, often viewed with anxiety by the host nation. A second factor encouraging the trend towards intercultural and interfaith dialogue is the increasing secularization of Western European societies, though one must be careful how we understand the term secularization. Part of the problem is the disenchantment with classical forms of religious belief and authority. People feel estranged from the traditional festival calendar or life cycle rituals, but may nevertheless seek alternative sources of spiritual nourishment. As a consequence, the classical religious communities have lost such power as they once held over their own adherents, and in the case of Christianity, their political power and authority within society as a whole. In such an environment, there is a growing attraction for religious communities to seek partners within other faith communities who find themselves in a similar situation. This trend may then be rationalized as a logical extension of certain universalistic impulses within the traditional faith itself. That is to say, on the practical and even political level, religious individuals and faith communities find themselves meeting and even joining together in common projects, such as to combat racism or to address environmental issues. However, the theological justification for such encounters tends to remain the domain of professional theologians or clergy with relatively little of the new thinking filtering down to the grassroots, though even this is changing. To introduce something of my own biography, I grew up in the Jewish community of London. The Jewish population in the United Kingdom is now about 280,000. In some ways, my upbringing was typical of a common pattern that emerged in the 20th century. Jews emigrated in massive numbers from Tsarist Russia at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, escaping from discrimination, persecution, and pogroms. My family ended up in England. I was born in 1942 and grew up in South London with all the advantages of a British public school education and the assumption that like my father, my three uncles and a cousin, I would become a medical doctor. My Jewish life and education began in an Orthodox Jewish synagogue in South London, most of whose members were not really Orthodox, either in their belief or their religious practice. They reflected the long-term effects on Judaism of the European emancipation. The Jewish communities of the Middle Ages 
were closed, self-regulating societies collectively subject to the government of the region or country where they were located. With the emancipation over time, Jews became instead individual members of Western society, increasingly more free to choose whether or to what extent they wished to remain bound to the Jewish community and tradition. Jewish law, which had previously regulated every aspect of Jewish life, communal as well as spiritual, in a closed society, now became something which one was free to adhere to or abandon. The family and emotional ties of Jewish religious life remained, but by the time I was growing up, the breakdown of the authority of the tradition resulted in a whole range of individual compromises. For example, we would go to synagogue on the Shabbat, but we would travel by car, though driving on Shabbat was forbidden by Jewish law, as it constituted a form of work. Like many others, however, we would park the car around the corner from the synagogue, out of sight, as a sign of public respect for the institution, though no one was fooled by our doing so. Many Jews simply lived with these kinds of contradictions, but nevertheless retained a formal loyalty to the orthodox framework. But already in the 19th century, a number of movements, variously labeled as reform, liberal, or progressive, beginning in Germany, but developing especially in the democratic climate of North America, began to emerge. They saw themselves as trying to preserve the best of the religious tradition while adopting the best of contemporary values from their surrounding society. These tendencies, alongside more secular ones like Zionism and different varieties of socialism, became areas of internal conflict within the Jewish world and remain divisive uh, until today. Of course, this picture is further complicated by the horrors of the Holocaust, which among other things, destroyed the great traditional orthodox centers of Jewish life in Eastern Europe, but also severely undermined the universalistic hopes and intellectual optimism of the progressive Jewish movements of Western Europe and the United States. The other great change in Jewish self-understanding today is the result of the creation of the State of Israel. It has restored some of the sense of lost identity and hope caused by the Holocaust through emphasizing the national element in Jewish life. My personal response to these contradictions and tensions was to abandon the synagogue immediately after my bar mitzvah at the age of 13, sensing in our highly selective ritual behavior at home only a kind of hypocrisy. My return to some kind of Jewish consciousness came through membership of the youth group of a reform synagogue. And some years later, I made the decision to study for the rabbinate to become a rabbi at the Leo Beck College in London. If we try to trace the origins of the modern rapprochement between Jews and Christians, a starting point would be a number of scholars in the late 19th and early 20th century. On the Jewish side, leading figures like Abraham Geiger, Hermann Cohen, Franz Rosenzweig, Martin Buber, and Claude Montefiore either studied the historical background to the Gospels or sought a theological understanding of the existence of Christianity from a Jewish perspective. From the Christian side, a number of major scholars, Léon Blois, uh, Henry Danby, Robert Travers Herford, Jacques Maritain, George Foot Moore, began to study Jewish sources in the Mishnah, Midrash, and Talmud and to seek to correct Christian misunderstand misunderstandings and misrepresentations of these central texts of Judaism. The recognition of the dangers inherent in anti-Semitism and its background in Christian anti-Jewish teachings led to the emergence of jointly sponsored organizations to confront these attitudes in America and in Europe in the years immediately before World War II. However, the rise of Nazism and the persecution of the Jewish population of Germany, leading to the horrors of the Holocaust, helped establish organizations intended to combat religious prejudice and racism, which would subsequently develop into those fostering interfaith dialogue. <clears throat> In 1942, William Temple, the Archbishop of, Canter of Canterbury, convened a meeting that led to the establishment of the Council of Christians and Jews in the United Kingdom. 
war. When the true extent of the Holocaust was recognized, Christians were confronted with deep theological questions about the extent to which Christian teachings had laid the ground for what had happened. In 1947, an emergency conference on anti-Semitism in Seligsberg, Germany, led to the establishment of the International Council of Christians and Jews. It formulated 10 points which were, to be, which were addressed to the churches. Four established the roots of Christianity in Judaism. Six emphasized that the church should no longer present Judaism in a negative way. In Amsterdam in 1948, the General Assembly of the World Council of Churches called upon all the churches to denounce anti-Semitism as absolutely irreconcilable with the Christian faith. Understandably, after the war, the German churches found themselves having completely to re-examine and re-evaluate the role of the church during the Nazi period, and particularly with regards to the persecution of the Jews. Already in 1945, the first tentative documents began to emerge, acknowledging responsibility at first for the suffering of those nations attacked by Germany. The Wort zur Judenfrage, a statement on the Jewish question from the Bruderat of the German Protestant Church in 1948, was the first German document after the Holocaust that began to make theological statements about Judaism. From the Roman Catholic Church, the decree Nostra Aetate, produced by the Second Vatican Council in October 1965, reflecting the personal concerns of Pope John XXIII, was a major step forward in Catholic-Jewish relations, particularly in its renouncing of the charge of deicide against the Jewish people. These and many subsequent church documents began to be written in consultation with Jewish representatives, opening up new dimensions that now fall broadly under the term dialogue. However, the theory of dialogue itself can be traced back to the writings of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, uh, who wrote in 1929. Now, the words of Martin Buber, a time of genuine religious conversations is beginning. Not those so-called but fictitious conversations in which none regarded and addressed his partner in reality, but genuine dialogues, speech from certainty to certainty but also from one open-hearted person to another open-hearted person. This change from theoretical pronouncements by one religion about its interpretation of the other to a mutually shared understanding built upon the personal encounter between people of different faiths is what defines the new dimension of interfaith dialogue. 